This is Victoria Wampler in the Medical SLP Summer Session class, and today we're going to be talking about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, more commonly referred to as CTE. Every year, between 1.6 and 3.8 million individuals suffer from sports-related concussions. Over their careers, the accumulations of these concussive and subconcussive hits to the head can cause a progressive neurodegenerative disease known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. In CTE, there is a progressive degeneration of brain tissue as well as a buildup of an abnormal protein called tau. Originally, CTE was termed punch drunk by Harrison Martland in the 1920s and it was talking about boxers who were left with cognitive and behavioral deficits after repeated head traumas during their careers. Over time, cases of CTE have expanded from boxers to athletes from many different contact sports, including football, rugby, wrestling, and hockey, as well as individuals in the armed forces. The individuals who suffer from CTE may not be diagnosed until decades after their most recent head trauma, but are faced with a lifetime of slowly progressive symptoms for which no cure is currently known. CTE is a progressive degenerative disease, and there is a clear environmental etiology of this disease, which would be the history of repetitive brain trauma over an unspecified amount of time. It affects athletes, which originally we thought there was only boxers involved, but now research has evolved to know that football players, wrestlers, soccer players, rugby players, hockey players, any athletes in a contact sport have been affected as well. There's also research that says that soldiers who are near blast sites are affected. And in one case, a victim of domestic violence was affected with CTE after repeated abuse. The symptoms of CTE include behavioral and mood deficits, such as judgment, reasoning, impulse control, aggression, and specifically explosivity and violence. There's also cognitive deficits, which come later in the, as the disease progresses including episodic memory problems, problems with executive functioning, and problems with attention. In individuals with CTE, the history of repeated brain trauma causes brain tissue degeneration. As you can see in these two images we have here, the cortex of people with CTE, including two football players on the image in the right, begins to shrink as the disease progresses. CTE also involves a buildup of, a, of the abnormal protein tau. As seen in this image, a tau protein is on microtubules. Head trauma, however, causes the tau to release from the microtubules and form neurofibrillary fi fiber tangles, which then attack the cell and kill it. Currently, an individual can only receive a true diagnosis of CTE after a post-mortem examination of the brain. However, advances in neuroimaging, such as the diffusion tensor MRI, otherwise known as DTI, can help detect subtle changes in axonal integrity and may help us detect CTE earlier down the line. Prevention plays a key part in CTE. Because we know the etiology of CTE, which is head trauma, an important role is preventing the head trauma from happening in the first place. Limiting exposure to trauma is important, and adhering to return to play guidelines in athletics is another important step in preventing CTE. Currently, there is no known treatment of CTE. CTE can be traced back to the 1920s in which neurologist Harrison Martland wrote an article for the Journal of American Medical Association in which he coined the term punch drunk. Punch drunk was used to describe a boxer who was professional and had experienced multiple head traumas over his career and after he retired was experiencing syndrome-like symptoms such as aggression, depression, withdrawal, and memory loss. In 1934, Harry Parker took took the term punch drunk a step further when he wrote an article for neuro Neuropsychopathology in which he talked about punch drunk as traumatic encephalopathy of professional puglicists. In 1937, Mills Paul renamed punch drunk Dementia Pugliatastica, which professionals, researchers, and scientists still use today.
1949, neurologist McDonald Critchley referred to dementia pugletastica as chronic progressive traumatic encephalopathy. He believed that there may be two clinical subtypes of this disease. The first being primarily behaviors and mood problems, including explosivity, depression, and violence. And the second being cognitive deficits, including problems with episodic memory, problems with executive functioning, and problems with attention. In the 1960s, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is first used without the word progressive, and researchers begin to believe that it does not only affect boxers, but also athletes from contact sports such as football, wrestling, and rugby. In 2005, Omalu and colleagues confirmed the first known case of CTE in an American football player. The confirmation of this American football player having CTE began what is now known as the concussion crisis in American football leagues. As a speech-language pathologist, we must look at the areas of the brain which CTE affects. The neurofibrillary tangles, which are made of the tau proteins, cause death in the cell. The death of these cells begin focally at the point of head trauma. Most notably, the temporal lobe and frontal lobes are affected, as well as the diencephalon and the brain stem. As can be seen here, these regions of the brain control important functions of the body which are vital to both life and communication. As SLPs, it is important to be able to connect the damage to the deficit in patients with CTA. The damage that they receive to the frontal and temporal lobes, as well as the diencephalon and brainstem, can cause cognitive and motor deficits that will have implications for therapy and treatment. SLPs must remember that CTE is a progressive disease and functional communication is the main goal. Seen here is a list of cognitive and motor deficits which are in the SLP scope of practice and would need to be worked on in therapy had a patient with CTE presented with these. Because of the progressive nature of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, functional communication is the goal. For an SLP, this would mean using compensatory strategies and caregiver training to help the patient before discharge. Swallowing also plays a hand in CTE. We must have strategies ready for the patient and a modified diet if need be. As with all patients with a progressive disease, it'll be important for the SLP to keep data, to track the patient as they move forward through therapy to determine when it is clinically appropriate to discharge these patients from the therapy. An SLP could possibly be consulted on a case for CTE for differential diagnosis. As you can see, CTE may look like stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or an acute TBI. Here we can see an example of a differential diagnosis. An SLP may need to make a differential diagnosis in a clinical setting, as chronic traumatic encephalopathy and Alzheimer's disease can look a lot alike. It would be important for an SLP to note that CTE starts with behavior deficits, whereas Alzheimer's disease starts with language deficits. Currently, the best way to prevent chronic traumatic encephalopathy is by educating and informing people about concussions and the dangers of head trauma to, pre to prevent this disease. In the future, researchers will continuously search for a treatment to cease and possibly reverse the buildup of the tau protein. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy affects individuals with a history of multiple head traumas, specifically athletes and soldiers with blast injuries. As SLPs, we focus on maintaining functional communication by working on memory, executive functioning, speech and motor control, and swallowing. This concludes our presentation for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTA, and the clinical implications it has for SLPs. Thank you for your time.